rice, 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 everything had rice in it. You went, a meal was, wasn't complete without rice. Yeah, from the rice farming community, <laughs> yes, all meals had rice in it. On this episode of Nourish, we're talking rice. Starting with the traditional delicacy associated with Cajun culture, featuring two of my favorite ingredients, rice and pork. And there is no better person to talk to than James Beard award-winning chef, Donald Link. Hey, how's it going? How you doing? Great. So, Donald, in Cajun culture, rice and pork is very prevalent. And for me, I need you to help me understand what is Cajun culture in particular. Uh, in particular, you know, Cajun food starts out as kind of a subsection of Creole in a lot of ways, you know. And But what you have are these different areas of Cajun culture where you have the, the French influence, you have the German influence. There's a direct line, if you look at like, when the French owned Louisiana before 1700, they, they weren't cooking French food. Okay, that's a misnomer of this whole process here. You know, the French influence comes from the Cajuns from Canada and the French Caribbean islands. In the mid-1700s, thousands of French Acadians were forced out of Nova Scotia by the British. They eventually settled in Louisiana, a Spanish territory at the time. Many came by way of other British colonies and French Caribbean colonies. And then you have this huge influx of Germans that come in in the mid to late 1800s. So the, the German influence is a lot of the sausage making and a lot of the rice farming. You know, boudin in particular from France was this emulsified veal chicken sausage. Okay. And then you've got these French names and with their sausage making, and then those size sausages begin to transform to a German style sausage, but they keep that French name. So then you've got the Germans, like my great great grandfather, Nicholas Sonbrecher, started farming rice in Cajun country in the 1880s and started to commercialize that business. So it just grew exponentially, you know, sometime around that point. So that's when you start seeing rice show up in Boudin. You know, you take all the off cuts, the livers and the tough meats, and you stew those down, mix it with the rice, and stuff it into a casing. My family's huge. You know, the, my dad has 100 first cousins on his mom's side. And then I have 48 first cousins. So the, there's a huge settlement. I, could, I think that the, the history was 1881, 41 German families showed up in Rain, Louisiana. My grandparents grew up a half a mile from each other. So I'd go to my granddad's house and we'd have the rabbit and dumplings, collard greens and pig's feet, and the black eyed peas, cream corn. We got a granny's house, the German Cajun side, and that was a lot of rice dressing, uh, some other pork and gravy over rice. The term Cajun can be misunderstood. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, the abbreviated name for Acadian, Cadian, became Cajun and aside from culture, described a form of cooking heavily dependent on fish and wildlife, along with whatever they could farm and raise. By the 1960s, the term Cajun had been transformed into a brand, and rice had become central to South Louisiana food traditions, as it was on many Southern tables. Like most great crops, uh, it came down to flavor. Everything is in terms of texture and flavor, which is mild hazelnutty. It provided an absolutely splendid base for the mingling of flavors. You have that rice serving as a palate upon which to mingle an extraordinary medley of flavor. Characteristic Southern dishes evolved to incorporate diverse cultural food ways and locally available ingredients like vegetables, game, pork, and seafood. Rice stretched thin provisions, but the tiny grain that formed the basis of regional cuisines across the South is not the rice you buy in stores today. Legendary varieties were nearly lost for a century until determined food detectives from around the world began working to put them back on local tables. It's originally known as gold seed rice. It's a wonderful golden color during the harvest season. We don't know where it's from. It's a South Asian rice. It might have come from West Africa. Uh, it might have come from Asia. In previous episodes, we detail how South Carolina's pre-Civil War rice economy, based on the expertise and labor of enslaved Africans at the time, made the region the best known rice producer in America. Carolina gold long grain rice was king. And it was this long grain version of the rice that in 1851 won the London medal as the best grain in the world 
and the 1853 Parisian Medal. Uh, and it was at that point that Carolina Gold was the rice variety that commanded the highest prices on the world rice market in Paris. In the years following the Civil War, the rice economy collapsed and the famed seed was assumed to be lost until a Georgia surgeon and duck hunter looking to reestablish the succulent rice as a feeding ground for migrating waterfowl tracked Carolina Gold to a government seed bank. Decades of work ensued to reestablish Carolina Gold with the help of dedicated growers and supporters like Glenn Roberts with the Carolina Gold Foundation and agricultural researchers. The greatest rice in the world in its most magnificent form is going to be available again. This work also led to the rediscovery of another famed rice that once dominated across the South. Uh, and it became grown under the name Red Bearded Rice in Georgia, throughout the South, all the way to Louisiana, all the way north to Kentucky. And this upland rice was grown garden style. At the turn of the 20th century, other varieties have become cheaper and more productive to grow commercially. And market forces drove red bearded rice into obscurity and presumed extinction until it was rediscovered growing on a hillside in Trinidad with a rich history sparked by the War of 1812. This group of people um, many of them who came from the Sea Islands of Georgia accepted that invitation by the British Army to fight as Royal Marines in the British Army against their former masters. And the promise was liberation and land. The enslaved Africans who didn't necessarily agree with the British, but they said freedom was more important than being enslaved. And so they fought with the British, they got their freedom. And then they went to Britain, and then they sent them to Trinidad. It didn't work out, and they took a lot of their products with them. That's but, exactly the story. Known there as Americans, these people preserved this rice, known locally as Maruga Hill rice, as a staple of their diet and cuisine. I was fortunate enough to see this heritage grain for myself recently with grower and ethnobotanist Francis Marine, and it is now being marketed in the States. When rice is harvested, it's first milled to clean it and remove the shaft or outer husk. The end product is brown rice, where the outer bran is preserved along with rice's nutrients and protein. In the low country, rice formed perlos, bogs, red rice, and hopping john. In Louisiana, these turned into etouffees, turtle sauce piquant, dirty rice, jambalaya, red beans and rice, and an essential part to gumbos. And that brings us back to Boudin. How did your family prepare rice and where do your traditions come from? Please share below. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.